Welcome to the Christian Man's Ministry Podcast. Let's get straight into it. Uh, thank you so much, uh, colleagues. This is um, a rather you know difficult topic to talk about, uh, but you know, one that I'm uh, one that I'm passionate about because of um, the need for us men to be responsible fathers, and the need for you know the families to be happy families. So we have to talk about it, despite you know the challenges, despite all the things that we may have or you know some other feelings that you may have but it's a topic that we have to grapple with so as a way of uh, uh introducing this i'll be talking about um uh, firstly i'll you know give sort of in a biblical reflection of what we want to be talking about and uh, how god sees us as uh, individuals as men uh, in relationship to our wives and uh the families that we are you know in in and then we want to talk about uh, the global trends of intimate partner violence so that you know we put you know, the south african context and the zimbabwean context uh, um, to, to the front of us so that we are able to see where we are coming from and where we are going and then we'll talk about uh, the fatherhood concept how you know fatherhood is conceptualized and how we can be able to see ourselves as fathers and how we can uh, go back to the mirror to see if we're still uh, able to to view ourselves as you know our fathers, and lastly, we want to talk about um, some prevention interventions that we are that we are privileged to have or that have been proven by science in this subject, so that we are able to tell whether these um, can be implemented in our settings or we still need some more evidence or we need some more help in order to for us to be able to implement them. So um, let's start. You know. Uh, colleagues by drawing some lessons from the, the the book of judges if you go to you know judges chapter 13 there is a story of manoah manoah and his wife uh, you probably know that uh, um they didn't have a child until god visited you know through his angel god visited you know the wife who was a hard working wife who was in the fields so god visited her and he spoke to her about the good things, the good tidings that he was going to do to um, this you know, family. So God spoke through the wife and not through the man. I want us to, to, to take note of this because this is very, very important. So uh, God can choose to speak to a woman and not to a man. So this is what happened, but you know, after, you know, God spoke to her. She was so generous with the information. She went, you know, back to her husband and said, you know, there's a man who spoke to me and he promised me good things. This is what he promised me, that we're going to have a child. You know, our troubles are going to end because, you know, this is what God has seen in us. So Manoah then said, I want to see this man also so that I can learn how to, you know, uh, um, um, go about this, how I can contribute towards you know, this goal that this man of God is bringing to our family. So Manoah then went, I mean, uh, uh, requested you know, a second chance and God granted the second chance. He spoke again to the woman and the woman went to the wife, I mean, to the, to the husband and said, this is the case, come listen. And then Manoah went and listened. The man of God repeated himself and then they were told what to do. So they prepared and then the child came and this was, um samson who became the king of israel the king of israel the giant who destroyed you know, the philistines who were troubling the israelites so let us you know uh briefly you know step back and uh, um look at it in this context that god can choose to communicate with a wife and not the husband this is something that we have to be accepting this is how god does it he can choose to bless a woman and not, you know, a husband at a certain time or at a particular time. This is God's doing. So we must, you know, accept it when the blessing comes through the wife and not through the husband. This is God's doing. And Manoah um, respected that. And, and you know, um, the good thing that Manoah did was even to request to hear how, you know, he must be able to care for the child. You know, we, we normally, 
probably, I must say this, in Africa, we normally prefer to talk about caring work as we you know, put it you know, in the hands of our women. But here is a man who is asking God how I can be able to care for this child. So he's already thinking about the nappies. He's already thinking about, you know, uh, feeding the baby, you know, uh, teaching the baby and all these things that normally men don't like. But he is a giant because he knows that this is a gift from God. He knows that he's supposed to be helping his wife. He knows that he's supposed to be caring for his wife. So um, as a couple, Manoa and you know, his wife, they decided to thank God with a burnt offering, and they did so. And they raised the child together, well through into marriage. This was something that you know, was done, planned by God. God knew very well that Manoa was you know, the head of the household, but he decided to communicate through the wife. He decided to raise the status of the wife so that the wife can be at an elevated state, so that you know, the family can you know, um, see itself as a reformed family, as a family that has, you know, uh, that is in the eyes of God. So as we, you know, go through the presentation that I'm going to be making, just think of a, your wife as someone who is special in the eyes of God. And her being special is not only, you know, for selfish reasons, but also for the benefit of the family. So if we treat women as special citizens and as special colleagues in the family, we will be able to see the value that is in them and we won't be able to abuse them. The word abuse, the word violence will not be found in our dictionaries, in our actions, in, in our activities that we do. So let us you know, view this as Manoah did as men so that we are able to uh, progress as humanity. So um, I like this verse when I'm talking about you know, this subject, Colossians 3 verse 19. Men, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. And when I checked you know, the, diction the dictionary uh, for the word harsh, I found quite a number of words that are used to describe it. One of them is abuse, bitter, resentful, not gender, etc., etc. So I, I like you know, that word abuse, which is the equivalence of you know, violence, which I'm going to be talking so much you know, in this uh, presentation, that men we must love our our wives we must not be harsh with them we must not be violent to our wives we mustn't be at all you know um abusing our wives so that we have a good life so i'll be repeating this verse so that it sinks in our hearts and in our minds so that we be able to um remember it much more so let us look at um what you know violence estimates are like you know in 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 in, in the world i'm privileged to be uh, one of the people who um participated in this uh, uh analysis of global you know surveys or global studies that you know we're looking at uh, uh, uh the contribution of violence against women particularly intimate partner violence which is you know the violence that you know uh, uh men perpetrate against their you know, loved ones, their, their, their wives, their spouses, or their partners. So we reviewed, you know, the data, and then we presented the data. What we found is uh, something that is not good, that you know, one in three women globally experience lifetime physical and sexual violence. And um, in terms of our non-partner sexual violence, we found that, you know, 7.2% of the women experience you know, this type of violence. And this is, you know, uh, a sexual violence that is experienced at the hands of someone who is not your partner. And at best we can describe this, uh, we can describe this as, you know, rape by a stranger. So this is, you know, something that has also uh, some mental health effects. Just imagine, you know, uh, being raped, you know, by a stranger or having, you know, uh, all those nasty experiences uh, with a, a stranger. So this was back then in 2013. Now, a follow-up study was conducted, you know, at, uh, at a global level to see where, you know, violence is, you know, um, in this context. So what was found is that there was just a very, you know, uh, a minimum shift. The world is not doing enough to, you know, prevent violence. It's still a problem that we are facing, 
So in 2018, um, um, this is you know, the statistic that you know, about 31% of women aged 15 or older experience intimate partner violence. And we, we talk about you know, IPV here as physical or sexual violence. So the thing is, we're still seeing one in three women experiencing you know, uh, violence. And uh, uh, in, in the first statistic, we saw that non-partner sexual violence was on 7.2%. Now it's 6%, just you know, uh, lowering by just one you know, percentage point. So we still have this problem. It is still persisting. It is still ongoing. It is still troubling us. So we need to be doing something. And if we, if we look at um, these statistics you know, by age, we realize that you know, one in four young women will have been subjected to violence by an intimate partner by the time they reach uh, their mid twenties, and this is the marriageable age. This is the marriage age, you know, for most you know, women that you know in their mid twenties, at 24, 25 thereabouts, they would have you know experienced an intimate partner violence experience, and this is not good. Imagine as a father knowing that my, you know, my daughter has been abused. And you are there probably to give in your daughter to another man, but yes, she has already been abused. This is not a nice experience. We need to be taking care of our you know, children. We need to be. Uh, uh, we need to take care of the community, the society that we live in, because we need to prevent violence. We need you know fatherhood, uh, which is preventative of you know this violence. Let's come back to South Africa, um, where you know most of us are living. South Africa has been regarded. Um, um, in 2020 by the Law and Order Index is, you know, lying in the bottom five countries with the lowest Law and Order Index score of 57 there. So it, it, it means a lot. And, and the statistics that are, you know, there, they, they you know, speak to this, you know, uh, point that, you know, we have, South Africa is one of the most violent countries in the world. I'm just, you know, flashing this so that, you know, we know where we are coming from and we know where most of us are living, what, you know, surrounds us and what should be done. And uh, South Africa has the lowest marriage rate on the continent. Many people in South Africa are not married. And uh, those who are married, the average age of marriage in South Africa is very, very high, you know, uh, because they marry very late and only a few of them, you know, marry in South Africa. And um, it is the second highest, it is the second highest rate of father absence in Africa after Namibia. So um, there's this you know, phenomenon whereby fathers are absent from their families. So I'm going to talk about this in greater detail uh, as, as we go on with the presentation. But uh, here we just need to conceptualize this as a problem to say there is a big problem of father absence the father is not there for the children physically as well as you know socially they're not there or emotionally they're not there and and we have a statistic there to back you know this argument that you know 64 percent of children grow up you know without their biological father present in their household and this is the public setting which is very uh um upsetting actually because we have to raise our children. We have to live with our children and raise them, you know, in the best manner that, you know, God allows us to. But if we are absent physically and emotionally, then our children have a big, big gap. And imagine who is filling this gap. Is they growing to adolescents? Who is filling this gap for, uh, my, for my girl child and for my boy child? You see that, you know, you know, there are some boyfriends coming in, some girlfriends coming in, there are some drugs coming in, there are some alcohol issues coming in to fill the gap that the father is running away from or that the father has not, you know, granted or not been granted to be, you know, um, uh, in this position. And we have low rates of paternal maintenance for children. So maybe someone, uh, maybe the father is not there, but, you know, they must be doing something. But here we are told that, you know, there's a low rate of maintenance. The father is not you know, taking part in the raising of the child. So this is uh, uh, a bad thing. And shockingly, we have a high rate of abuse and neglect of children by men in South Africa. So this is the context where some of us or quite a number of us here are living in, which we need to be addressing. 
as you know people living in South Africa or people who have roots or some relations with you know uh, South Africa. So as you wake up, you know, on a daily basis, or maybe you switch onto the television, you read a paper, these are the subhead, these are the news bulletin that you get to hear about crime statistics, about, you know, uh, uh, South Africa being a dangerous place to be about, but we need to stand up as fathers, as Christian ministries, a uh, men's ministry, we need to stand up and change, you know, this story. We need to change so that we have a better story to tell, a better place for our children is jeremiah said that um pray for the city where you are living so that it can be a better city that is able to provide for you because you'll be there in in in, in exile for a long time so we need to be praying for this we need to be aware of this situation and turn it around so that is a situation that is uh better for us to live in so let's look at uh, uh some of the statistics that we we find in south africa um uh, uh, once again, I was privileged to be, you know, part of, you know, uh, uh, the team that uh, put together these figures, where we were asked, you know, by the Department of uh, uh, Social Development, Women and uh, Children's Affairs to look into, you know, violence issues and, you know, um, put, you know, uh, 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 a synthesis and synthesize the data to see where we are uh, a, a couple of years ago. So in, in this you know, report, uh, we found that um, women are murdered you know, by you know, their partners. Uh, but you know, of all those who are murdered, of all the women who are murdered, 56% are murdered by their partners. So this is a very uh, dark moment to know that you know, uh, the highest percentage, more than half of the women who are murdered in South Africa, it is the partner someone who said i love you who is you know committing this crime and um in surveys we have 50 percent of the men you know confirming that yes i've been a perpetrator of violence against a woman particularly you know my own partner and we also have you know physical violence experiences you know in which is a one in three uh that is 33 percent and when we talk of you know sexual violence experiences in south africa overall we have uh, one in five people reporting you know, sexual violence. And um, we also have child abuse, which is uh, almost you know, 40%. So this is the situation. This is the place where we are living in, the place where we are raising our children. You might think that you, know, you are safe, you're okay, but you know, this is the context. Your child comes across those other children or mingles with children who are also exposed or who are coming from backgrounds that are exposed to you know these violent experiences so it must matter to you also when you see these statistics even if you think that you know it's okay for you but uh, you live in a uh, you don't live in a social vacuum but you live in a community where others are so you need to be careful and you need to be praying and doing something and thinking about this situation so if you think that you know um it's not something that is important as men in the marketplace, think about violence as something that disturbs, you know, the figures, that disturbs uh, the economic, you know, turnaround of the country. Um, KPMG um, uh, produced a report uh, uh, around the you know, 2014, which you know put together all the you know figures and uh, concluded that about 28.4 billion is lost due to intimate partner violence or due to gender-based violence in south africa how is it so it's too costly to ignore we should be doing something so that you know we have this money in our pockets and what is the equivalence of this amount of money of these billions you know they provided some statistics here to say this is money that is enough to provide youth wage subsidies for 100 percent of youth who are currently unemployed or this is something that is able to provide national health insurance to uh, one quarter of the South African population, or it's something that is enough to build over half a million RDP houses. It is capable of paying all the child support grants for eight years until you know this year, if they had started long back in 2014. It can pay 900,000 engineering students fees, and it can fund over 200,000 primary school teachers you know, in terms of salaries for one year. This is a lot of money. So think about this, not only, you know, at a country level, 
think about it at, an, at a family level to say you are losing a lot of money if you're abusing your partner, if you're, you know, uh, uh, um, if you're exposing your partner to, to violence. How? We talk about direct costs, we talk about indirect costs, we talk about uh, opportunity costs. We need to be funding, you know, uh, the health system to take care of, you know, the abuse that, you know, is caused onto these women and so forth and so forth. So there's so much, you know, that you can talk about. It's it, it, at one point I said to myself, should we help people be silent? And then we ask, you know, CEOs of companies on the round table, CEOs, you know, in, uh, um, to be talking about violence. Probably it, they can be had because of this great impact that you know this subject has on the people. So um, th those are the figures for you, you know, colleagues. We need to be doing something to this problem. Let's look at uh, where we are as a region. Uh, um, the, you know, these global rates of intimate partner violence, but you know, of importance here is the Southern African region and this, you know, uh, let me say, let me call it the Sub-Saharan African region, which has the highest, you know, rates of, you know, intimate partner violence uh, in excess of uh, uh, 30%. And does it matter, the issue, the issue of relationships, does it matter in terms of our health? Yes, it does. Uh, as far back as 2009, there was this, you know, study that was, um, that was conducted by uh, uh, um, the South African Medical Research Council. And they found out that interpersonal violence is one of the 10 leading single causes of deaths. This is something that is very important for us to know. And even if you look at uh, the years lost, interpersonal violence, you know, it also features among the first you know, five of the 10. So we have to be worried about this. We have to take note of you know, the importance of preventing violence because this is something of great importance. Come you know, back to you know, from 2009 to 2017, we can see that assault is number two in terms of uh, uh, the distribution of non-natural causes of death you know, by, by you know, broad groups. So we have uh, about 7,688 uh, people who um, reported, you know, uh, is dying because of assault, and this is about 15% of the total. So intimate partner violence um, is a part of this you know, statistic that we should be um, taking care of. So what about the socio-spiritual cause of partner violence? We have to imagine injuring or killing a person whom God speaks to your family through. For example, if you are Manoah killing or abusing your wife whom God has designated as a mouthpiece. Just attend a funeral of a virtuous woman and you hear what the people will be saying in terms of uh, what this woman has done in their lives. Then you can begin to think about the cost, the spiritual cost that woman that this woman has been doing and now she's gone. Or the social cause that this woman has been doing, now she's gone. Or maybe she has been you know, disabled. She can, now, she can no longer do the things that she used to do. So those are some of the you know, social costs that we can think about when you think about you know, partner violence. Then um, I tend to you know, the subject of fatherhood. I'd like to begin by saying that you know, many fathers today never knew their own fathers because of circumstances that you know, uh, their fathers were in or they you know, couldn't allow you know, uh, it to happen or they lacked experience and guidance regarding father roles and experiences. Because you know, uh, probably in, in, in a number of uh, uh, generations among you know, colleagues who are here, you, you may realize that um, many of the fathers, they, they lacked the experience and guidance regarding the father roles. You know, um, my dad, you know, passed on when I was only two years old. So I was raised, I had, you know, father figures in my life, but none of them were able to teach me about how to become a father, what responsibilities I have. But now is the opportunity for, for, for us as men. We need to be start, we need to start teaching our children so that when they grow up, they'll be able to take up father roles. 
and become responsible fathers. And I, I like this definition of fatherhood that comes from uh, um, Professor Richter, who said that uh, uh, a man becomes a father and is treated with respect attached to the role when he takes responsibility for his family and becomes a role model of appropriate behavior for young men. And this reminds me of the word of God you know, from Malachi 4, you know, verse 6, which says that, uh, you know, he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come um, uh, and smite the land with a curse. So in other words, what I'm trying to say here is that um, fathers must take responsibilities for their actions, must take responsibilities to look after their own children and their families and to cover, you know, their, their spouses with all the protection that they need. Look at these statistics. Um, it's an incomplete set of statistics, but I want you to see the trend that we see here. Um, this is about you know, children under 15 years and under who were interviewed whether their fathers were deceased or whether their fathers were alive but absent from the household. So from 1993 up until 2007, we see uh, uh, an increasing trend, an increasing rate of you know, fathers who are diseased, and you can also talk about HIV in this context. But, you know, uh, of particular importance here is the second figure, the second row that talks about fathers who are alive but absent from their household. They are not, you know, taking care of their households. This has increased from 36% to 45%. And earlier on, I cited the figure of 64% of absent fathers. So this is something that is worrying that you know we, we are moving on a very bad tra trajectory we're moving on a very bad you know uh, 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 stance because fathers are increasingly being absent from you know you know their roles from the roles that they should be taking in so what does you know their non-involvement uh, uh what is there what, what are the contributing factors of the non-involvement non sometimes it's about migration sometimes it's about income levels sometimes it's about in kinship ties that's you know after you give birth you just give your child to to your mom or to another relative to look after and to live with them and blah 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 unemployment also you know precarious work alcohol abuse some people are not able to look after their families because of alcohol abuse and we also have gender ideologies maternal and child you know maternal and uh, uh, cultural get there's so many reasons why you know we have all this and and um just looking at this graph there's an amazing you know increasing trend of people beginning to uh um uh look at you know um parenting and fatherhood is an important factor. So from around you know, 2010, thereabout, there's so many studies, people are funding studies on parenting on fatherhood, like nobody's business, because they've realized that this is the way to go. It's a game changer. So um, we also have to take it accordingly. And, and I'm just trying to show you, I'm just trying to show you that uh, parenting and nurturing care throughout childhood is not, you know, uh, a small business. We should be, you know, doing this you know, so much. Uh, we should be doing this uh, uh, in a very, you know, uh, good way. Uh, we should be committed. There's so many fields, you know, that we should be pushing as men in the marketplace. We need to look at the socio-political field, the economic, the policies, the services, communities. And we need to be involved to make sure that all these services are good for raising our children and for giving us the power to ensure that we have a better uh, uh, life as fathers to prevent violence in our lives. And we need to make sure that the relationships, learning, safety and security, nutrition and health are well catered for throughout the ages of our children. So, you know, people propose that we need to, we need a structured parenting uh, 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 interventions, uh, um, uh, cascade that includes you know improving parent-child interaction we need uh, uh, interventions that promote communication and play praise and reinforce you know, uh, positive child behaviors we need to create learning activities we need to apply positive discipline and avoid harsh punishment you know i, I like you know, positive discipline we, we um sometime you know from 2013 until 2015 we ran a program here in south africa uh, it was in pretoria which where we were uh, uh, trying to move away from 
you know, harsh punishments and uh, violence is a way of disciplining children towards what you call positive discipline. You discipline them in a positive way without exercising uh, harsh you know, ways. So we need to be promoting these and teaching our children because this is where it comes from. For you to become uh, an abuser, you probably have gone through the same system. So we need to promote clear instruction rule setting in our houses and to support self-regulation. We need to promote love, attachment, and sense of uh, belonging. Then there's this uh, uh, piece of work that, you, that, that we also did, uh, whose statistics I want us to, to, to look at here, where I'm asking whether you, know, you think fatherhood matters. Yes, it does. This is the South African setting. The, we collected this data um, in, in, in Twana region um, um, uh, around you know, 2014. So the children who are living with their biological parents those who are living with one, this is about 15%. And those who are living with you know, both parents, it's about 41% uh, um, for boys and you know, 35 you know, for girls. So I I'm just showing you this to illustrate where it begins, where violence and neglect of our own children and our own families begins. Because if you are not living with your children, this is where it all begins. And then, um, the same children whom we interviewed, who were around, you know, almost you know, 4,000, these same children, they reported that, you know, in their childhood, uh, before they turned, you know, before they celebrated their 15th birthday, they had experienced sexual violence. Uh, um, boys, you know, they reported about, you know, 25% uh, uh, of them experiencing, you know, sexual violence, or I'm sorry, perpetrating sexual violence, and then, uh, uh, um, for girls, it was 19 you know, uh, percent. And then um, uh, you can see for the emotional violence and physical violence. Uh, then um, these same children who are grade eight learners who were interviewed, you know, they also spoke about their experiences with alcohol and boys, you know, more than one in 10, you know, mentioned that they have had alcohol as yet. And then, um, 7.6, almost, you know, one in 10 girls, they've had alcohol. Just think of, you know, if you have children who are in, 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 in grade eight and below or around grade eight, that they've, you know, started experiencing or using drugs. One in 10 boys, one in 20, you know, girls. Then they've also started having sex. 38% uh, of the boys mentioned that. And then uh, the girls almost, you know, uh, one in 10, then uh, um, they had, you know, uh, uh, what we call anal sex as well. Uh, almost, you know, a, a quarter of the boys. Then we have uh, boys and girls also, you know, having multiple sexual partners, and they've also participated in what we call transactional sex or having sex for benefits. So this is uh, something that this is an ugly phase of that we find in our children, and we also see that you know, these children. They also reported that, among other things, they've experienced violence in their home, and this is where they experience the most, you know, forms of violence and the, you know, the, the most frequency of, you know, the violence that are reported at home. Look at the statistic that is there, and um, I continue to ask this: Why fatherhood matters? Using the same data set of the, you know, the study that we conducted, so. Now, these were children who were abused in their, you know, uh, uh, when they were young. Now, they are in intimate partner relationships with themselves. Now, these are the boy-girl relationships. Look at what they are doing. These things are interrelated. Normally, researchers found that when you are abused as a child, you are more likely to be abusing. That's why we say, you know, as Christians, we need to, to cut this umbilical cord. We need to 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 turn the you know turn the tables around so that you know this generational uh, 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 um, behavior is destroyed so that what I experienced before cannot be experienced again. So here we have emotional violence. Uh, uh, you know between you know forty and fifty percent of them are reporting that they have had you know a, a emotional experience, and then between uh, a quarter and a third reporting sexual violence, and then uh, um, uh, 
physical violence being reported by 17% of the boys and 13% of the girls. And if you say physical or sexual you know, violence, you see the figures again you know, rising. So this is not you know, a joke. This is a, a statistic that is real that we you know, collected from the field and it is very much worrying. So we should be worried as fathers. We should be taking care of our children and we should be taking steps to prevent violence in our families. If we look at our fatherhood in the context of Zimbabwe, that was South Africa, now coming to, to Zimbabwe, you realize that in Zimbabwe, um, there's this concept, we, 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 we researched in Zimbabwe, you know, uh, among women who were pregnant, we asked them whether men uh, who gave them this pregnancy were taking care of them, and um, about six, percent of them reported that uh, the fathers denied responsibility. They refused to take care of the pregnancy as well as you know, parenting the children that you know, they, 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 uh, they gave to the woman. So we asked them, how did they, com how did they communicate you know, this? So uh, only 14% reported that you know, we talked to each other nicely and the rest, it was a matter of you know violence. Um, they spoke through physical violence, through sexual violence, and through emotional violence and other forms of violence. So, my message, you know, here, colleagues, is um, we should be able to know how to communicate with other people, and at best to communicate with our own partners whom we are in love with. There is no reason why you should be communicating in a violent manner. After all, we are not supposed to deny responsibility for you know, taking care of you know, the pregnancy that you're responsible for. And you know, the factors that are associated with this, they are very many. You think about you know, violence itself, you think about uh, 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 bride, price, bride price payment. It's, it's, it's an important factor that has been uh, uh, established that because it shows how committed one is uh, uh, to the pregnancy or to the woman that you, you know, married and so forth and so forth. I have to, to, to run. Um, men, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. Are you able to say to your sweetheart, is the lily among the thorns, so is my love among the daughters? Are you able to say, thou art all fair, my love, there is no spot in thee, or you have already caused some mental spots, some emotional spots, some physical spots on her body. Is love gender to you or you are part of the people who are causing violence to your partner? What are the causes of violence in couples? We find them at different levels. We find these causes uh, at individual level, at relationship level, at community level, as well as at societal level. I'll just pick a few to illustrate. For example, that um, uh, intra-parental uh, uh, violence, when you grow up in a family that has been having violence, you're more likely to observe that violence and take it as the norm and think that it's a good thing, that when you want something, it has to be commanded through violence and then it, you get it. So you become an abuser because you have seen and you have experienced and you have grown up in a family that is abusing other people. You know, depression is one other factor that is causing that. You talk of drugs and alcohol, you talk of, uh, you know, masculinities and femininities. They are uh, causes of, you know, victimization as well as you know, perpetration. In a relationship, if you have, you know, poor relationships or conflicts, you know, management skills, you're more likely to be, you know, perpetrating violence uh, because you can't solve problems by talking. Then we have multiple partners or infidelity. You know, these are also relationship issues that you know, lead to violence. At a community level, if a community has a weak community sanction, if it gives weak community sanctions, it's more likely to uh, lead to violence. Poverty has been you know, regarded also as a cause of you know, uh, violence and, and um, quite so much because of how it exposes women and men differently and then we end up seeing men abusing you know, their partners and then society at large what are the gender norms that people are taking as if these are the rules from god that they are using 
in order to justify and to perpetrate violence against women and also for women to you know, uh, 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 be victimized. So we need to turn these into opportunities to have you know, better lives. So I'm going to you know, turn on to just show you some of um, a few results from this study that we conducted uh, a few years ago. Uh, this is a study whereby most of the women who responded in this study were saying that, yes, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. So I'm, I'm putting it to you, colleagues, to say, you know, our, our, our faith, you know, these are people who share the same faith with us, who are being abused. And these are the people who uh, we as men, we are, are abusing. Um, so they are educated, these are the ages. And, you know, bride price featured quite so much, you know, in this study is something that if not used carefully, it leads to abuse. But if it used carefully, you know, because one can use it carefully and say, I paid, you know, bride price. This is something that is very, very important to me. So I have to prize it. And I have to take it as an important thing. I have to value my wife. But if you're taking it, you know, the other, the wrong way, you will say, I bought, you know, this woman and our bills. This is what other people are saying. But if you have gold, if you have something that is special, you have to take care of it. Um, having a wedding is something, again, that is, you know, very important. Um, problems due to men's alcohol use. This is where it starts. Men are reportedly having uh, money problems, family problems, and uh, violence and misunderstandings with the partner and others. Uh, sorry for the other language that is popping in there. I borrowed this slide from my um, uh, other presentation that um, I, I you know, presented to the people who loved in this language. Uh, men, remember that we have to love our eyes and not to be harsh to them. How is communication like in, 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 in relationships? So after coming back from work, do we communicate about his day? We were asking these women, do you communicate about his day and about your day, his feelings and about your feelings? You can see that you know, this is on a sliding scale. We the Partners tend to communicate about the woman's day more than they communicate about the men's day. Men are closed. They don't communicate. This is a problem, men. We need to be communicating so that we are at the same level with our women. So now, if you're not able to communicate to say, how was your day? How was the day, sweetheart? You know, my darling, how are you going to be communicating about sex? So you see the statistic falling from 83, now going to, you know, uh, um, as little as one in three, 35%. They don't even communicate. 25% they rarely communicate, 27% sometimes, only 13%, just a little bit over uh, one in 10, saying, I always communicate, you know with my wife about this subject. So men, don't just do it. Communicate, talk about it. Sometimes it's not possible to have it, but it helps to prevent violence in the family. And how often do you quarrel? We ask these women, sometimes, often, and rarely. And what were the partner controlling behaviors? Now we are beginning to, to, to get you know, to the deeper you know, aspects of the story. Women reported that you know they were restricted, you know, um, from the left you know, bar, uh, um, from the left bar, which is eleven point seven percent. Women reported that they were restricted from seeing their friends, and then from conducting their family of birth, and then from knowing where uh, um, he insisted all the time to know where this woman is. This is not good, and you go to the right, you know, but the right side, he demands permission. Uh, um, um, the, the woman you know, has to get permission in order for her to get health care. This is not a good thing. She can't access health without you know, the partner saying, yes, you can. This is not a nice story to tell. So, it, you know, we, we have this, you know, quotation from a, a pregnant woman who reported, you know, that, um, uh, there was this couple, if he finds out that she went out of the gate and went to the church, she'll be beaten up that day. So this is a woman who is, you know, remember, we're talking about in the Christian couples here. This is a woman who is 
required not to leave the house. She will be beaten if she leaves the house. How controlling are you? We need to be thinking about these colleagues. And another one says, I want to say that I plan everything with my husband in everything that we want to do. If he wants to buy a property, we sit down and plan together. If he decides to pay school fees for the kids, we plan all this together because we, when I started you know, reading this you know, quotation, I said, oh, perfect, beautiful. This is nice. This is good. Excellent. But when I analyzed it further, I realized that, okay, she's involved, but she's not the originator. She's not involved in bringing decisions into the family. At least she's, in, she's consulted. But we want more women who are bringing ideas to the table so that also the men can also take ideas from her and then we move on like that. Then, you know, women are talking about you know, small family meetings without their wives. They plan together as a couple, but you know, when it comes to visiting, you know, relatives, everything just changes. So what about emotional violence? Let's, let's get deeper and deeper. We asked you know, these women to report about you know, emotional violence in the last 12 months. And this is what they reported. So to the right side, we have you know, the average, you know, we have you know, uh, the, 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 the combined, any form of you know, uh, violence in that these women experienced in the last 12 months. So this was 40%. This is far too high in a community to have you know, violence of this nature. We have women, who are reporting that in the last 12 months I was abused. Um, I have to move faster. Then economic or financial violence. We have one in three here who are reporting economic violence. And how do we measure economic violence? We ask questions such as, you know, does it prohibit you from working, from trading, from earning an income? So you see, about 22% are being prohibited. This is not good for our women. 5% report that you know, their earnings are being taken without their permission. You know, um, then we have uh, um, uh, men who are not providing money to run the house, even if they have the money. They're not giving their wives this money. They're not planning together. They're not doing anything. And if we put everything you know, else together here, any form of economic violence, we realize that almost or something close to a third, between a quarter and a third of women are experiencing economic or financial violence in our lives. And these are coming from the Christian background as I showed you earlier on. So my message is, let's not forget Colossians 3 verse 19, colleagues, men love your wives, do not be harsh with them. Um, let me try to be a bit faster. Now, I like this verse, 1 Peter 3 verse 7, which says, likewise husbands, Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. I like the last part. If you are abusing your wife, your prayers will not be ahead. There is a ceiling. They go down. They bounce back. They don't reach God because you have to respect your wife. Then in terms of physical violence, we realized that we found that more than one in five experience physical violence. And physical violence is described you know, by those you know, terms. Uh, um, has he slapped you? Has he pushed, shoved, or pulled your hair? You know, were you hit with a fist? Did he kick you, drag you, beaten you, choke you, bent you, and so forth and so forth? So these are, this is how we measure this. In terms of sexual violence, we need to be talking about this, colleagues, because this is very, very important. Um, and this is more than a third of the women in total who are reporting you know, sexual violence in the last you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, 12 months. Firstly, you know, from the left, physically forced you to have sexual intercourse when you did not want to. This is almost one in five. And then ever have sexual intercourse you didn't want to because you are afraid of what your husband or partner might do. So they just, you know, go there and have sex because they know that not having it with him now, it means I'm going to be abused. So they just have, it's a duty to them. They don't enjoy it. They don't cover it and they don't, you know, do uh, anything. So, um, and then lastly, you know, doing some humiliating or degrading, you know, things. 
So does planning matter in a couple? Yes, it does. And who is responsible for planning a pregnancy uh, in, in, a, in a family? They said, yes, you know, 83% um, say all of us, both of us, we need to be planning. And uh, some said only a woman needs, to, you know, 1% said only a man. So we, we it then looked into the data and asked ourselves, what about, you know, when it comes to who wanted to have the current pregnancy? So we found that 75% um, of the men wanted, 65, I mean, 67% of the women wanted to have this current pregnancy and 15% uh, he wanted, but she didn't want. There was this discordancy. And then 17%, she wanted, but he didn't want. So you note the discordancy. And then uh, where both of them said, yes, we wanted, it was uh, uh, something close to two thirds. And then there was one in five where both didn't want, but the pregnancy just came. And then either wanted 15.9%. So we look at this and say, okay, this, this, these, there are conflicts as far as unplanned pregnancies come in lives, in people's lives. So how do we resolve this? And we found that in resolving this, there was quite a lot of violence that was experienced and a lot of health problems resulted from this. There was sexual, physical, emotional violence. And at the time of visiting the clinic for antenatal care, women experienced a lot of violence. And we also realized that you know, women experienced depression, postnatal depression after delivery, because the, it was ruining, it was haunting them, that experience of, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, both of them not wanting or either of them not wanting this pregnancy. Imagine carrying a baby that one of you doesn't want. And then there were, you know, um, low birth weight, you know, in, in so many of them, it was associated with, you know, uh, uh, this scenario. And some even uh, wanted to commit suicide. And there were some STIs which were, you know, reported or which were associated with, you know, these responses. So let us now to turn towards the end of you know, the presentation where we talk about the consequences as well as uh, some of the uh, um, uh, prevention strategies. So in terms of, you know, these consequences, we have, you know, a number of health problems. For example, we have almost three times uh, uh, women reporting poor daily functioning because of violence, intimate partner violence for that matter. And uh, almost three, you know, times as well, that is 2.7 times um, reporting uh, mental and neurological disorders, which include postnatal depression, suicidal ideation, and so forth. And some even, you know, uh, wanted to, to terminate pregnancies more than two, you know, times. Uh, uh, um, and then we have poor general health and other, you know, in other, we categorize them as excessive health service use, health risk, you know, behavior. You know, people who are abused, they use health services so often because they're always stressed, they're always having challenges, so they're always seeking help instead of, you know, conducting their business like other women. And we have, you know, sexual and reproductive health problems, communicable problems, non-communicable problems, some may even gain weight and, you know, and so forth and so forth. Injuries are also part of you know, this. What about, you know, social and behavioral problems? We have subsequent violence victimization. Like I said, you know, before that um, women who have been abused or, or who, who, are, who are abused in childhood or who witnessed their mothers being abused by their fathers, they sort of internalize that and they learn that, okay, if you're a woman, it means you're going to be abused. If you're a husband, it means you're going to abuse. So we have four and a half times, you know, women saying that, yes, this is the case with me because they were abused. Now they are being abused or the, you know, men were, you know, uh, witnessed abuse, and then they are also abusing their partners. Then we have internalizing behavior problems and and planned pregnancies among people who are abused, two and a half times attachment problems, and then the whole range of other uh, 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 behaviors, paired cognitive and academic performance. You know, even when you want to do studies, when you abuse, it doesn't you know go well because of you know this challenge. So what can we do, colleagues? in order to prevent you know, violence. This is the last uh, uh, um, 
segment of this presentation. Firstly, we need to challenge social norms. What social norms do we need to challenge? Those norms that we were taught that a woman is like this at the bottom of the, of the ladder in the house. No. We should be thinking in terms of manor that a woman is not just, you know, at the bottom. God can choose to upraise, to bring her to the top. She's also equal in terms of, uh, in terms of you know, uh, 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 the image that she has before God with me. So we need to change those social norms, those spiritual norms that we have, that we hold. And then we have communication relationship skills. Sometimes we just have, you know, uh, 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 people in the house, you know, they're just watching the television. They're talking about, oh, man, you, Chelsea, which one is doing better? And if you don't have good communication skills, you may end up having an argument that, you know, leads into chaos. So we must have these communication skills. There are programs such as home visiting by experts who, you know, begin to counsel and to offer support. These have been proved to be successful programs. And there are also programs of microfinance or gender equality training, whereby women's standards of, you know, or women's economic lives have been upgraded or they are given economic microfinance systems to, to, to look into and then once their economic you know, status rises, they began to uh, prevent uh, more and more violence, and even the men fears now to you know uh, abuse them. So it's something. It's it's a good prevention strategy. So we need also to visit the schools. We need to talk about the schools so that we prevent dating violence, bystander interventions. We need to be preventing presenting uh, preventing this. And then secondly, uh, we also have these. Uh, uh, um, prevention strategies, which include multi-component programs. It has been seen that in research that um, it's not only one you know, program that is a bullet, that is a game changer. Sometimes combining one or two more programs can help. We need to be mobilizing communities. We need educational interventions. We need to reduce alcohol use and access. I cannot say this more. We saw it during um, during the the COVID pandemic, that um, when alcohol was banned, there was a reduction, a massive reduction in terms of women who were reporting abuse, women who were abused. We 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 have data that suggests that in South Africa, we also have data that suggests the same in in Zimbabwe, and we also wrote a report in that to that respect. And then we also have some clinical inquiries and reference. We have school sexual abuse awareness programs that have been proved in other countries to be useful in terms of uh, pro uh, um, uh, preventing uh, violence. Then we have um, what we call, you know, um, this range of, you know, uh, um, strategies, advocacy, home visiting, couples therapy, um, perpetrator programs, dealing with the perpetrator themselves, like what we are doing now, talking to men, because men are the people who are, you know, in, in the perpetration category where women are receiving the violence. So we need to be talking about it and we need to promote the same kinds of communication with our children, with our boys and young men. And there are also programs like, you know, psycho, psychological therapy for survivors and multiple component programs, family and child therapy, um, uh, shelters. Uh, those who come from Zimbabwe, they know the Musasa shelters. Um, Sasa Project shelters and others. In here in South Africa, there are also quite a number of you know, these shelters that when you, women who are abused, they may be taken to those shelters. And when they are there, they are being taught so many things. Some of the things that they are taught are simply you know, economic you know, programs so that when they are released, they are able to do something of their own and you know, generate income. Once they generate income, they will be able to fend off you know, the violence because they're now regarded as another, falling into another economic category. But above all, changing social norms is one thing that is very, very important. We have these programs that have been successful. The IMAGE study, uh, which is the intervention with microfinance for AIDS and gender equity, which was you know, very successful in South Africa. And if you are you know, logging in from Uganda, there's the SASA project, which has been evaluated and it has been quite successful in a number of you know um, um, in a number of ways. So colleagues, I would like to end here um, by just saying that um, 
in terms of further absence, there are quite a number of things that we can talk about. We have a lot of you know programs that we can uh, um, uh, integrate much more um, uh, similar to what I've you know, already alluded to, so that we can be able to prevent violence and even to a larger scale. Thank you, colleagues, for uh, taking time to listen to this presentation. I hope you got you know at least one thing out of it. I hand it back to you, uh, Brother Farai. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Shamu. Thank you very much. This was such a powerful session. Um, very, very informative, and the proof is in is in the figures. Uh, there's no denying uh, the fact.